All right, engineers, in this video today, we are going to talk about the blood supply to the spinal cord. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the blood supply to the spinal cord is extremely important. We need to know this blood supply. Let's say, for example, you got a patient coming in, right? He's coming in, let's say he's 55. He's got a past medical history of high cholesterol. He's a 35, you know, pack your smoker. He, um, he also has a history of hypertension. He's complaining about like some nonspecific abdominal pain, low back pain. You palpate on his abdomen. You feel kind of like a pulsatile mass on his abdomen. He's got can maybe a little bit decreased pulses in his, in his distal pedal pulses, right? You ultrasound his abdomen. You find a big old dilated aorta. He's got to go to the OR. Let's say that it's like six centimeters in diameter. It's like, oh man, we got to send this guy to the OR. He goes to the OR. They do the surgery, right? They repair the aortic aneurysm. He comes post-op, you go check on him. He's already had episodes of fecal incontinence, urinary incontinence, and paraplegia. What the heck happened? Guess what? It's going to be related to this blood supply. So if we understand the blood supply, we'll be able to really understand a lot of the pathophysiology behind certain diseases, okay? And we'll talk about that condition that we're talking about for this patient at the end. All right, so blood flow to the spinal cord. The first thing that I want you to know is not just looking at all the little vessels around the spinal cord, but first knowing the main vessels that are going to be feeding into these small vessels around the spinal cord. That's the first important thing. So let's start over here. Let's start with our pump, which is that left side of the heart, that systemic pump, right? So you guys know here, we have this little chamber here. What is this guy? That's our left atrium. Then we have over here, we got this big pump here. That's our left ventricle. See that thick left ventricle? That guy is going to pump blood where? He's going to pump blood. So it goes left atrium into the left ventricle. Left ventricle is going to pump up into the aorta. We're going to go up that ascending aorta into the aortic arch. Can you guys tell me the three vessels coming off the ascending aorta of the aortic arch? We have the brachiocephalic artery, right? Brachiocephalic. Second one is the left common carotid. And what is the third one? The left subclavian, right? So the left subclavian. Now, what I want you to remember here is that the left subclavian, and also there's going to be another branch over here, right? You know the brachiocephalic artery? Eventually, so here, let's put here, let's put brachiocephalic, the brachiocephalic artery. It actually is going to branch into two vessels, the right common carotid artery, and it's also going to branch into what's called the right subclavian artery. So there's two subclavian vessels, the right subclavian vessel, which comes off the brachiocephalic artery, and also this, we're going to just abbreviate here, left subclavian artery here, which is going to be coming off the aortic arch. Now, let's just follow this left subclavian artery, but just remember, everything that we show here on that left subclavian artery is going to be the same on the right subclavian artery. Now, the subclavian artery has different parts, right? There's actually three parts of the subclavian artery. If you guys really want to know, let's just say really quickly, really quickly, there's three parts here of the subclavian artery. Let's say here's our subclavian artery. The three parts of the subclavian artery are actually split up by a muscle here, and it's called the anterior scalene. So you're going to have a muscle here called that anterior scalene. What happens is there's a part that's pre-scalene, there's a part that's actually within the interscalene, so we'll put part two, which is at the level of the anterior scalene, and then part three, which is after the anterior scalene. There's three parts of it, right? We're focusing on two branches here, and these two branches are going to come off the first part. The first part that comes off that subclavian artery that we really care about is the vertebral artery, okay? That comes off the first part. Then, around this level here, this second part, which is going to be kind of behind, I'm going to draw it with a dotted line. This part here is going to be the next vessel that we care about. It's actually called the costocervical trunk, but it, it actually branches into two vessels. One of the vessels here is called the supreme intercostal, and the other one here is going to be called the deep cervical. So what I want us to know is that there's two branches coming off the subclavian arteries that are going to feed into the spinal cord. What are those two vessels? The one coming off the first part is the vertebral arteries. So let's write that one down here. So the first vessel that we have to talk about here is the vertebral arteries. Right? Then 
The second vessel that comes off the subclavian, but what part does it come off of? The second part, which is kind of interscalenic, okay? That's called the costal cervical trunk. It gives one branch called the supreme intercostal and the other branch called the deep cervical. That's the other branch I want you to remember. That's this one. So the second one is the deep cervical arteries. Sweet. Okay. So we covered those big branches here. These are going to supply more of the upper parts of the spinal cord. Now we continue down, right? So we go the ascending aorta, aortic arch. Now we're going to come down the back through the thoracic aorta. So now let's say that we're here at the thoracic aorta. Let's actually separate. Let's pretend for a second that I'm going to draw an imaginary line here. And this imaginary line here, we're going to just say is a part of the separation between these two vessels. Okay. It's, I'll explain here in a second. So we come down through the thoracic aorta. As we come down through this descending part here, the thoracic aorta, it's going to give off branches. And these are going to be working on the posterior aspect of our ribs. These are called your posterior intercostal arteries. So that's what I want you to know here. So this is called your posterior intercostal arteries, okay? As we go lower, right, we're gonna descend down even further into like the lower abdomen. As we go down into the lower abdomen, there's other vessels that branch off the aorta. And these ones are in the lower part, so they're below the ribs into our lumbar spine area. So that's gonna be called our lumbar arteries. So what are these vessels here coming down a little bit more? These are called your lumbar arteries. And really there is another branch. I'm not really super concerned with you guys knowing it, but it's called your lateral sacral arteries. But again, the main ones that I want you to know here that are gonna be feeding the spinal cord from top to bottom is vertebral, deep cervical, posterior intercostal, and lumbar arteries. What do they do? Okay, here we have the spinal cord, right? When we look at the spinal cord, there's obviously going to be the two parts of it. We're going to kind of split this in half here. We have the posterior part and the anterior part. This anterior part has a vessel running within this anterior fissure here, this anterior median fissure, a little divot. This vessel sits in it. This vessel here is called the anterior spinal artery. Okay, it's called the anterior spinal artery. There's two little vessels back here that sit on the back, right? And these kind of like little posterior lateral sulci. And these are called your posterior spinal arteries. So these are called your posterior spinal arteries. Now, what you need to know is that the anterior spinal artery is going to supply blood to pretty much the anterior two thirds of the spinal cord. The posterior spinal artery will supply the posterior one-third of the spinal cord. Okay, so again, posterior spinal artery supplies the posterior one-third of the spinal cord. Anterior spinal artery supplies the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. These vessels, through more detail we'll explain in a second, feed into these posterior and anterior spinal arteries. Right? So again, these will feed into these anterior and posterior spinal arteries, and that's what we have to go on to and talk about next. All right, so we talked about the blood supply. What are those vessels? Vert vertebral, descending, uh, the deep cervical, the posterior intercostal, the lumbar, and if you really want to be special, that lateral sacral artery at the bottom. We talked about the anterior spinal artery, supplies the anterior two-thirds, posterior spinal artery supplies the posterior one-third. Now we have to kind of talk about a little bit more is how those vessels Particularly, we're going to use one example. We're going to talk about the posterior intercostal artery. We're going to follow that vessel and specifically talk about how that vessel feeds into the posterior and anterior spinal arteries because that's important, right? So which vessel are we going to pretend that this is obviously our aorta here, right? So this is our aorta, this big son of a gun sitting in front of the vertebral bodies. Here we're going to have kind of a cross section of the spinal cord here. You see our dorsal roots. Our ventral roots coming into our spinal nerves here, right? Here's going to be our kind of intervertebral disc with that little jelly, the nucleus propulsus. Here's going to be our transverse processes. Here's our spinous process. And here's kind of that spinal canal where the spinal cord runs through, okay? Off the aorta, we're going to follow a branch, okay? So this will come off both sides here. Here will be a posterior intercostal artery. Here will be a posterior intercostal artery, right? So the posterior intercostal artery, it'll come around the body, 
around this kind of transverse process. And it gives off a couple branches. Some of these branches we don't really care about. For example, it might give off what's called a costal vertebral branch. It might give off some cutaneous branches like a middle, medial cutaneous branch and a lateral cutaneous branch. We don't care about that. What we care about is this branch right here. Once this branch kind of enters into that spinal canal, it's called a specific name. Okay, so the first thing that we had here first, and we're going to kind of track all of this here. The first step was the posterior intercostal arteries. The second one that I want you to know here is this branch moving into the spinal canal. That's called our spinal branch of the posterior intercostal artery. The spinal branch will then do something really cool. It'll then move along this kind of spinal nerve and give a branch that moves along the dorsal root and gives a branch that moves along the ventral root. These branches, and we'll mark these here, are gonna be your anterior radicular artery and posterior radicular artery. Okay, the posterior radicular artery will then eventually feed into the posterior spinal arteries. And the anterior radicular artery will then feed into the anterior spinal arteries. And there actually is kind of like a nice little connection between these two called the vasa corona. Called the vasa corona. So again, to mark it down here, to follow the, the blood flow, first thing we had is the aorta. Off the aorta comes the posterior intercostal arteries. They then move into the second part. What's the second branch that I want you to know? That spinal branch of the posterior intercostal arteries. Then from the spinal branch, it breaks into two parts. One is going to be the posterior radicular artery. The other one is called the anterior radicular artery. The posterior radicular artery will feed into what's called the posterior spinal artery. The anterior radicular artery will feed into the anterior spinal artery. And there's a nice little connection between these two called the vasa corona. Beautiful, right? All right, let's blast through this really quick. Let's review, guys. Posterior intercostal artery moves around, gives off some branches. You might see these in the textbooks, like your costal vertebral branch, like a medial cutaneous branch and a lateral cutaneous branch, all that stuff. We don't care about all that. We care about the spinal branch. Spinal branch then branches, goes here, posterior radicular artery, moves here, anterior radicular artery, anterior radicular feeds into the anterior spinal. Posterior spinal will be fed by the posterior radicular. A nice little kind of connection between these two called the vasa corona. Beautiful. One last thing I need to mention. Around T10, T12 area, okay? So approximately T10 to T12 and down, okay? The anterior spinal artery, its main blood supply, obviously it's getting it from these kind of uh, anterior radicular arteries. But from T10, T12 down, the major blood supply to the anterior spinal artery is a very special vessel that you guys need to know that comes up on exams. So around T10, T12, you're going to have this vessel that feeds directly into this, and it is called the artery of Adam Kivich. Also, it's sometimes referred to as the uh, kind of great anterior segmental medullary artery. Sometimes you'll just see this in your exams as artery of Adamkovich. I want you to know that this is the main, the main blood supply that's going to feed into what? The anterior spinal artery from T10, T12, and below. You damage this, you pretty much don't get any blood supply to the anterior spinal artery. It doesn't supply the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. And it's going to lead to that condition that we talked about in the front, in the beginning of the video. Okay? So where does it come? Let's actually draw it in orange. So you know coming here, we had that kind of spinal branch here. Coming off the spinal branch, directly off that spinal branch, it feeds directly into that guy. So that is a vessel that I don't want you to forget that usually around T10, T12 level coming off that left posterior intercostal vessel, 
From that point down, it is the major blood supply of the anterior spinal artery. What is that vessel called? Artery of Adamkovich, or the great anterior segmental medullary artery. That's what I want you to know for the blood supply here. Now, last thing I want to talk about is you hit this vessel during the aortic aneurysm repair. Why does that cause the symptoms that we just discussed in the beginning of the video? All right, so we talked about this blood supply. I just want to quickly finish up talking about kind of a clinical correlation of why knowing blood supply to the spinal cord is important. And what we're going to talk about is kind of a variant of what's called anterior spinal artery syndrome. Okay, very important thing. And this is why sometimes just knowing something as simple as the blood supply to the spinal cord can be very important in diagnostic information, right? So anterior spinal artery syndrome is pretty much whenever this anterior spinal artery is not either getting enough blood supply, it's damaged, it's occluded, whatever, and it's not getting the blood supply to what portion of the spinal cord? To the anterior two thirds of the spinal cord. All this stuff is jacked up, right? And if because it's all jacked up, what are the things that are gonna be affected in this area? One of the big ones is what sits right here in that anterior gray horn. That is the cell bodies of our somatic nervous system, right? So in the cell bodies of our somatic nervous system, if these are damaged, what do these guys supply? They are going to be supplying our skeletal muscles. And if these are damaged in supplying the skeletal muscles, are we gonna be able to allow for these muscles to function? No, it's gonna to lead to paralysis. And we said that this paralysis is usually gonna be affecting the lower extremities. Why? Because do you remember at what level the anterior spinal artery, its primary blood supply came from the artery of Adamkovich. We set around T10, T12, and below. So from that point, you're pretty much talking about the lower extremities. So the anterior gray horn, all those neurons going to the skeletal muscles of the lower extremities are going to be affected, damaged, gone. And because of that, these patients will present with a type of paralysis, right? So they're going to present with a type of paralysis here. So we're going to have here usually a, a type of paraplegia, right? So this is going to lead to a type of paraplegia. All right. So the next thing that we need to talk about here, not only we had, do we have this degree of paraplegia, but what else is some other structures that are present in this section here? You know, here in this section here, you don't have lateral gray horns, you just have some nuclei that are actually present in this area called your interomedial medial nuclei. And these guys actually go out and supply your parts of your parasympathetic nervous system, like maybe the in parts of the gut and your actual bladder. So that's important. Also, one more structure that kind of runs around in this area you have these things, these little descending autonomic nerve fibers that are also running just adjacent here. They also get knocked out. And the other thing that we could talk about here technically that can also get knocked out is parts of your spinal thalamic tract, right? So you're gonna have your, what's called your anterior lateral system, which carries your pain and temperature and crude touch and pressure sensations. That could also get damaged. So we know that they're gonna present with paraplegia due to damage to the anterior gray horn. We also know that they're gonna present with, if they damage the purple structures, what does that lead to? That leads to bilateral loss of pain and temperature below that level of the injury, right? The spinal cord injury. We also know that if you damage these intermedial medial nuclei and they're descending autonomic fibers that are going to them, what does that lead to? Well, now you can't control the lower ends of the gut and the bladder. So now we know that we have these fibers here coming to the gut, right? If these are damaged, if these descending autonomic nerve fibers are damaged and they're according nuclei, then what happens is, is that this detrusor muscle isn't getting the proper nerve supply anymore, okay? If it's not getting the proper nerve supply, it's not going to be able to contract. And because it can't contract, 
Now what happens is the bladder starts overfilling and overfilling and overfilling and eventually it'll stretch to a point where the person starts to exhibit episodes of what's called overflow incontinence. And same thing here, because now these parasympathetic nervous system fibers, which are supposed to be supplying the smooth muscle around our uh, in parts of the colon, sigmoid colon, because those guys aren't able to contract and expel the feces out, what happens? It starts distending. And as it starts distending, and these areas aren't able to properly function anymore, it starts to overflow and they develop a fecal incontinence. In the same way, those neurons also supply those internal anal and internal urethral sphincters, the involuntary one, right? And so because those might be also not getting their nerve supply, they may relax. And if these are relaxing, that's gonna allow for urine to pass. If these are relaxing, that may allow for poopy to pass. And so they can develop a sense of urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence due to the damage to those descending autonomic nerve fibers and potentially those uh, intermedial medial nuclei. So they can develop what kind of thing? Urinary incontinence, which may be a type of overflow incontinence, or they can develop a type of fecal incontinence. All right, sweet deal. And we already talked about how they may have, again, loss of somatic motor neuron supply to your lower extremity skeletal muscles. And if they lose that, they develop that paralysis. So that lower extremity paralysis, all right? Along with that bilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation. So this kind of describes that anterior spinal artery syndrome and its relationship to why we need to know the underlying blood supply. Hi, Nijner. So in this video, we talk about the blood supply to the spinal cord. We talk a little bit about that anterior spinal artery syndrome. And I hope all of this stuff made sense. I hope you guys did enjoy it. If you guys did, hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, Instagram, Patreon. Go check those out. All right, Nijner. As always, until next time.